missions. That should be the heartbeat of every Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-focused church. That's why uh, taking a month of the year seems just uh, almost uh, uh, pointless because it should be every month, every week, we, we should be focused on missions. We got extra videos going. We had the opportunity a few weeks ago to have Brother Adams with us, and um, I hope you were encouraged by him. Uh, he is uh, associated with that video we just watched, Operation Go, and um, he is the Latin American director, actually. He uh, wrote us this letter. He said, Dear friends and ministry partners at Elm Grove, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 is an insightful passage about of partnership, people working together with a unity of purpose in any endeavor yields many important benefits. Not only is more accomplished by the efforts of many rather than just one, there is also the added value of the encouragement and blessing that touches all those involved. He says this, he says, please accept my sincerest gratitude for your church's recent decision to fund our Operation Go Training Institute in Peru, scheduled for July 15th through 16th. If you're unaware, we completely funded that trip for them. We were able to present that to our church, and our church now is able to completely support this training institute in Peru. He says he has spoken uh, this week with the host pastor uh, down in Peru, and he is so excited and encouraged that we were able to confirm the meeting because of our donation of $1,250. He is expecting 100 or more local pastors to be present, leaders, national missionaries from various regions of Peru uh, that are going to attend this training. He said he was told that some will travel up to 18 hours to be able to attend their training, to give them resources to reach the lost. He says, what a joy and privilege I feel to be able to spend 9 to 12 hours sharing with these faithful servants of the Lord, encouraging them in their labors and giving them the opportunity of two days of spiritual refreshment and warm Christian fellowship. He says he wishes each of us uh, could be there with him and witness how the Holy Spirit works in the hearts of these dear men. He said if past experiences hold true, some will come deeply discouraged, perhaps even to the point of quitting because of the constant difficulties they and their families face. He says the impact of these training institutes, they offer lodging and food and fellowship, the inspiration along with the tools that they give to these men free of charge is nothing short of amazing. He says to hear their testimonies and to see them go back to their fields of service with a renewed hope and a, a renewed zeal is worth every resource that is invested. He said every mile that they travel and every hour that they spend away from home is worth it. Thank you, Elm Grove. That, that is so important. I, I mean, being able to, to equip, he says, close to 100, if not more, local pastors. I just read an article this week uh, talking about how it's uh, encouraging and how we need to really focus. Uh, the article mentioned the Philippines and how we should be training and equipping local pastors. A lot of countries have closed borders to Americans. That means we can have American uh, uh, um, people called to the mission field, but they will likely not have an opportunity to go into said mission field because the borders are closed. But countries like the Philippines have almost free access in and out of other countries. So if we equip uh, national pastors from different countries, missions, then they have a greater opportunity to enter countries and see souls saved. That's the importance of missions. Grab your Bible with me this morning. Go to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter number 22. Hold your place there, Matthew 22. And also flip back to Mark chapter 13. Matthew 22. Hold your place, jump to Mark chapter 13.
for sake of turning, uh, you may remain seated. But Mark 13, verse number 10, uh, this verse really stuck out to me this year. It says, but, or, or, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. I'm going to read that again. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. Jump back with me to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, we're going to begin in verse number 34. Matthew 22 and 34 says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let's pray and we'll get into this this morning. Lord, again, we're just thankful to meet in your house, to open your word. Lord, I pray for your spirit to be present. Lord, we know that your word says wherever two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst there. And we ask that we just feel you here. Lord, I pray for open hearts. I pray for decisions to be made. Lord, the topic of missions is something that should be uh, not taken lightly. And I pray that whatever I say would be directly from you. I pray it would be directly for us. Lord, be with this message that you've laid on my heart now. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, that word publish is, is basically to declare, to uh, uh, make known, to uh, uh, um, really publicize, right? Get the word out there. So if the, if the gospel is to be uh, published in all nations, right? And the gospel must first be published among all nations. That means we got to be able to get the word out there. When somebody publishes a book, right? They don't publish it and just sit there and do no advertising. They don't put it up for sale. They, they, they get the word out there. My wife actually we went through this process. She published a book. And, and during the process, we're putting it on Facebook. And we're giving it to friends. And we're doing everything possible so that people will be able to buy the thing. No one bought any. I'm just teasing. Okay? But here, here's the objective. We, you don't want to publicize something. You don't want uh, maybe something to be known to you. But let no one else know about it. My son recently, uh, we signed him up for soccer. Sixth grade soccer is such a blessing. It's even more of a blessing when your wife decides that you, as in me, should be the coach of it. Okay, so I am now coaching six-year-old soccer, and what a joy. <laughs> okay, so we had our first practice this last week, and our first game uh, was yesterday. But as a parent, understand, as a coach, I know information that maybe the parents don't. Many of you have had children who have played sports or something like that. But in order for the parents to be aware of the information, I have to make it public. I, I, I need to let them know. So we were going kind of back and forth because I was waiting to hear from the director of the, the uh, soccer uh, program that we're a part of. So the parents were waiting on me and everybody's like, what is going on? Well, we finally were able to get on the same page and, and all the information was distributed. But if I was to hold the time of games all to myself, I'd have some upset parents. I'd have some very confused kids. Right? I, I, I would be uh, in a world of hurt, so to speak. I can imagine the nasty letters I'd receive. Right? Uh, all of these things, but it's our responsibility in Christ and in Matthew thir or Mark 13 there. He's talking about end times. Uh, the disciples are asking him, how will we know this is the end? How, how will we know you're returning? How will we know these things? And he, he gives this list of, of things that are taking place, but he makes it a point for them to be aware, he says the gospel must first be published among all nations. Right? The early church here, uh, uh, as they were growing, as they were maturing, as they were getting people, uh, nurturing and raising disciples, they were experiencing uh, uh, this persecution that Christ speaks about in uh, Mark 13. They're going through these difficult times. They're facing actual persecutions. 
And since the time of Christ, there have been uh, uh, Christians who are persecuted in their land, in their regions, wherever they're trying to make public the word of God, the gospel of Christ. And, and Christians, they, they, they've been persecuted in their mission fields since the time of Christ. And we can understand, though, we're in a, a open nation as of now. Amen. We are able to meet in the house of God. We are able to have church services. We're able to own a Bible. We are able to speak of Christ uh, to those around us. But even though we're in this uh, area that we could consider safe from persecution, our vision of God's kingdom, of our responsibility, our vision of what God intends for us can't be limited to what only happens to us. Missions is a, a national, a worldwide thing. If we're sitting here and we're saying, well, we're fine. Everything's fine with us, with Elm Grove. Everything is perfectly fine with the way I'm being a Christian. We can't properly approach the topic of missions. We can't look at a topic like telling uh, the world of Jesus Christ. We can't look at a, a video like uh, um, Operation Go. And, and we can't focus on uh, only the things that we experience. We have to be mindful of what they go through. D did you catch some of that video? Listen, that as of 2020, there are over 7.7 7 billion people in the world. That video said 50% of them have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. 3.8 something billion people have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And you know what's sad is I meet people and I hear of people. I was just talking to a pastor friend not that long ago. They encountered somebody in their neighborhood who had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's in America. That, that happens in our neighborhoods. That happens where we are, where, where we live. Then we see in Matthew chapter 20, 22, and we can see this familiar passage where uh, uh, the, the Pharisees are coming to Christ and, and they're trying to trip him up. This lawyer is asking him this question, trying to tempt him and saying, Master, which is the greatest, great commandment in the law? If, if you're so great, if you know everything, what's the greatest thing? Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. We want to talk about missions. We need to bring up how is your love for Christ? Do you love Christ? Right, right, that, that's a mindset that we really have to get a hold of because uh, really we can look at people and we can tell if they love things. Do you love your spouse? Yes, brother, then I do. Okay. Hey, I love my wife. But if I ignored her, if I paid no attention, if I talked bad about her, if I continued to just uh, 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 make jokes about her and make fun of her and poke at her, and you'd be like, do you actually love your wife? Hey, do you love your kids? You know, it's easy as parents to poke fun of our kids, but let me remind uh, everybody here, they take note of that. They're, they're, they know how you love so what does that mean? At home, you play with them, you love them, uh, you give them hugs, but you're around your buddy. Oh, that's just how he acts. He's a knucklehead. I can't do anything with that kid. He's a brat. They listen to that. Right? The same is true with any relationship. If when you are alone with that individual, you are all love, you are all concern, you are all compassion, but then you get around individuals uh, that maybe you hang out with and you're doing nothing but belittle that person, ignoring that person. They don't ultimately matter in this situation. They're going to know if you love them. How is your love for Christ? Because at church, it's easy to love God, isn't it? I'm here. I showed up this morning. I made it out to church. I'm here. I love God. Brother Daniel, I am a Christian. I've heard that before knocking on doors. I just want to ask you a question, sir. Are you a Christian? Of course I'm a Christian. Okay, a, a Christian is somebody who loves God. Right? You are Christ-like. Christ is God in human form. God is love. Do you love God? God. 
So as this morning, we could say, yes, I love, but you're around a specific group. How is it during the week for you? Do people know that you love God? Listen, as we're going through missions emphasis, he says the greatest thing, the greatest commandment, the, the greatest thing that God has ever told us is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That is the greatest thing you can do as a Christian. What does that mean? Listen, if you can't make a Sunday night, God is not going to fault you. If you can't show up on a Wednesday night because of your schedule, God is not going to fault you. What he's concerned about is do you love him? Do you care for him? Because this is the first and great commandment. And from there, we can then approach missions. We can then approach the topic of reaching the lost. There's a, uh, a couple things that we have to look at when we're looking at our love for God and, and missions and how they relate to one another. And the first one is your perspective of it. Your perspective of it. I read a story, and I'm, I'm sure I've, uh, I've told it to the teens, and I may have said it from this very pulpit, but I, I understand this a perfect illustration. There were a, a shoe company here in the U.S., and they were growing, and they were uh, growing, and they were selling tons of shoes, and they decided, we are going to branch out. We are going to go international. We're going to open up locations in other places because we're just booming so much in the, in the U.S. People elsewhere got to love our shoes as much as Americans do. So they decide to send two salesmen to kind of get the lay of the land uh, in a foreign country. And, and the men get there and they're, they're each in their own region and they're going around. And uh, one of the salesmen, after about a week, uh, messages back to his employer. He says, listen, there's no point in our shoe company coming here. This nation, it, it, there, there's no point at all. Nobody here wears shoes. There's no reason for us to set up shop here. Half a week later, the other salesman, uh, getting a lay of the land, writes back, and everything is in bold. He says, hurry up, send everybody that you can. The CEO says, what in the world are you talking about? He says, you need to send as many salesmen with as many truckloads of shoes as you possibly can. He says, why? He says, nobody wears shoes here. Our perspective, how we approach our love for God in the aspect of missions, what do you think of it? How do you envision missions going? Is your idea of missions you handing somebody a track once in a lifetime? Is that missions? Yeah. It is missions. Sharing the gospel. But what is our perspective in the, in the realm of God's love for us? Him sending his son, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Not you individually. Everybody individually. He so loved the world. He sent his son to die for us. Why? That we can have eternal life. That, that we can accept him as our personal Lord and Savior. Be able uh, to then, with this love, tell others. Hebrews 12, verse number 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That is a perspective. But for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, somebody can approach a topic like persecution. Somebody can look at uh, maybe somebody else ridiculing them because they want to share the gospel with them. I can't tell them about Christ. They're going to get a bad opinion about me. They're going to make fun of me. They're never going to want to talk to me again. When we look at a passage like Hebrews 12 too, we can see Christ and he had the understanding. Listen, I am going to go through momentary displeasure for the joy that is set before me. I might go through a little bit of hurt now, a little bit of uncomfortableness now. Listen, it is intimidating at times to share your faith. 
There, there are people who uh, I have run into in the past, especially when I uh, got into the ministry, and they'll say, what are you doing now? I said, I'm actually a youth pastor, or I'm an assistant pastor. And they look at me and they say, what in the world happened to you? And it's intimidating because they knew who I was in high school. They knew who I was in my early 20s. They knew who I was when we used to hang out together. And they said, there's been a shift. And I said, because God loves me. Because of his love for me, now I understand the reason that I do this. The reason for me doing this is through my love for him. It's for the future understanding. What is it, my potential as a Christian, if I have the proper perspective, the proper love for Christ, I can say I might be ridiculed now, but that person might be able to spend an eternity in heaven one day. Jesus Christ says, I'm going to go through difficulty now, but through my uh, crucifixion, through the punishment, torture, through all of the ridicule that I am going to face, the world has an opportunity to join me in heaven one day. Everybody, because of what I'm going through, everybody that you have contact with has an opportunity for glory. To have an eternal relationship with God. But it's all based on your perspective. This track isn't important, Brother Daniel. That track is life-changing. There's a story of a, a man who, who was walking through and, and he was just at a gas station. He says, I don't know why. Pastor always tells me to put these tracks out. I don't know what to do. And he just threw it in a convertible. He walks into the store. A lady comes in and she's raising this thing up. She says, who in the world littered in my convertible? She says, I don't want your trash. He says, well, ma'am, uh, my pastor told me that I need to give that out. I didn't know what to do with this. So I just tossed it in there on my way by. I'm sorry about that. Two weeks later, she showed up at church, told the pastor she accepted Christ as her savior. Amen. It's important. What is your perspective David Livingston uh, was a Scottish missionary and explorer, and he sent, spent 33 years of, uh, in the heart of Africa. He endured much suffering as he labored to spread the gospel and open the, the continent to missionaries. This godly missionary once said this, he said, people talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. He says, can, can that be called a sacrifice which is simply paid back as a small part of a great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Amen. It is emphatically no sacrifice. He says, say rather, it is a privilege. He says, anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then, with the foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life, may make us pause may cause us, uh, the spirit in us to waver, may cause our souls to sink, but let this only be for a moment. So that all these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall hereafter be revealed in and for us. It says, I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk. When we remember the great sacrifice which he made who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. We view things in such a negative perspective so often. But if we focus on our love for God and what he intends for us to do as Christians, that perspective shifts. When we are in sweet relationship with God, we're seeking his uh, 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 communication. We're seeking his communion. We're seeking his uh, uh, character for our lives. Then our perspectives by default are going to change. Where's your perspective? When we talk of missions, there has to be a purpose. Not just a perspective, but there's a purpose behind it, right? I understand uh, there was a, a story told of a blind, illiterate soul winner. This lady showed up at church one day. She received Christ and she was burdened about reaching the lost. She couldn't see a wink. So she, she walks up to her pastor one day and, and she said, Pastor, can you please turn in my Bible to John 3.16? He says, well, sure. 
turns in the Bible. She said, can you please underline that verse in a lovely red pen for me? He said, well, of course. She said, pastor, will you please mark this page in my Bible for me so I know how to find it? He says, of course. She says, thank you so much, pastor. She takes her Bible back and she leaves. The pastor said, a few days gone by, and he's like, what in the world is this lady going to do with this Bible? She's blind, so clearly she can't read it. What is she doing? So one day, he decided to follow her for a little bit. Following this lady, he noticed about the time school was out that she made her way up to the schoolhouse, and she made her way to the steps of the school, and she'd stand there. And she'd hear the school bells and she'd hear the doors open and the kids coming out. And she'd say, excuse me, son, excuse me. Can you come here? Come here. Hey, can you come here? And they would come. And she said, can you read? So, yes, ma'am. She said, oh, wonderful. And she'd flip to that page in her Bible. She said, there's an underlined verse on this page. Can you read this verse for me, please? And that pastor said, I would watch these young men and women and they would read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And she said, do you know what that means? And she would see countless souls come to a saving knowledge of Christ. She knew her purpose as a Christian. Missions is not just the purpose of missionaries. Missions, emphasis, that's because it's our purpose. It's our role. It's our job. This blind, uh, illiterate soul winner, it was, she was coined as. Over 24 of these young men that she saw uh, saved are now in full-time ministry. She understood her purpose as a soul winner. What is your purpose as a Christian? What is your role as a Christian? What responsibilities do you, do you lay claim on your life? You say, this is what I am supposed to do. John 15, verse number 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. He continues on, he says, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. How important is this? Jesus Christ, he made that first choice. Right? He, he opted to come to a, a sin-stricken world and to lay down his life willingly for the joy that was set before him so that all may come to a saving knowledge of him. He made the choice to love and to die for us. Mankind, to offer us, mankind, eternal life. That was his purpose in coming. That is why he came. So then we make the next choice. Our responsibility, the next choice. Verse 16 again, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. That ye should, you should go and bring forth fruit. It's our choice now to make this a matter of purpose in our lives, to accept or to reject his offer. That, that is our choice. Understand this, without his choice, without this choice in our lives, we would have no choice. Without his choice to come and to die for us, we would have no choice in where eternity is spent. We, we would have no access to the throne of God. We, we would have no access to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This eternal knowledge that I have for myself and I pray each one here does that you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. And why is that important? Because I've made it a point of purpose in my life. I want to see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That, that's why when I was asked to put together this spring program, I said, what is important? I know the gospel. 
And how do we close out something like this? I know. Tell everybody that we can. Get them here on our property and say, we love you. God loves you. How amazing that is. What a great opportunity. And he made this choice. He chose me. He ordained me that what? That I should go forth and bring or uh, bring forth fruit. That I should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask in the Father, of the Father in my name, he, that he may give you. Man, the, the purpose of understanding. This blind lady understood her purpose. See soul safe. I wonder how many of you this year have witnessed somebody come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I wonder how many of you in the year 2021 lay witness personally to someone accepting Christ as Savior. Because if you say, my goal as a Christian, I want to grow in my relationship with God. I want to grow in my communion with God. I want to make sure that I'm serving God to the fullest. But if you've never saw somebody come to Christ as Savior, you're not doing the job right. It's our job. You say, I've never even accepted Christ as my Savior. Hey, that's why I'm preaching this morning. I want you to know Christ died for you that you may know him as your personal Lord and Savior. It's a purpose. But beyond that, beyond my perspective, beyond my purpose, there's pleasure. There's a pleasure in missions. There, there's a pleasure in this I heard this this week. If you're bored as a Christian, you're doing it wrong. Man, how true is that? If you just come to church, you're like, man, this is boring. You're doing it all wrong. Man, Christ is exciting. The, the blessings that he pours out are exciting. The opportunities that he lays before us, they're exciting. And guess what? You can have fun doing it. Man, we get to serve a living, loving God who wants nothing more than to bless our socks off. He wants to say, come, and guess what? I'm just going to pour out blessings upon you because of my love for you. But how do we get those things? By being obedient. There's pleasure in obedience. Why? Because in obedience, there's not as much punishment. Anybody with children understands that as well. When you obey me, son, you don't get your butt spanked. We're going to have a conversation this afternoon, me and that lovely little blessing. But why? Because, hey, in obedience is when true blessings are poured out on us. In, in obedience is when true love is shown. John 14, verse number six, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Where is your love for God? Where, where, what perspective do you have of what a Sunday morning is? What's your perspective of preaching? Because this is a way for me to honor my God. This is a way for me to serve my God. But it's also a way for you to worship with me. It's, it's a way for you to learn and, and to, to glean from the word of God. I'm not saying that I'm going to teach you something you don't know. But maybe you can grab hold of something that God has for you. Not what brother Daniel has for you. I'm of no importance in the big picture of God's purpose. Where's your, where's your pleasure at? Hey, if, if you love me, John 14, 15 says, keep my commandments. What is that? A commandment is a divine rule, right? It, it's this rule that is expected to be observed. And the greatest commandment, love the Lord thy God. With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. But guess what? Don't stop there. He said, the second is like unto the first, that ye love your neighbor as yourself. That's missions. That's understanding. I have accepted a loving Savior as my personal 
ticket to eternity. As my personal relationship, I have chosen him because he had chosen me first. He selected uh, his appointed time to come and to die for mankind in that I can look to the scriptures. I can hear it from a preacher. I can receive it in a track. I can get it from somebody who is fulfilling their role, their purpose as a Christian. And I can say, I need this for myself. This morning, if you have never accepted Christ as your savior, understand no man cometh unto the Father. You cannot enter heaven but by the gift of Jesus Christ. The ultimate picture of missions, Jesus Christ. The ultimate picture, our example, Jesus Christ. Understanding what is your perspective of Christ this morning? Your perspective of your life as a Christian, your perspective of what church is, your perspective of what Bible reading is, of what prayer is, of what uh, 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 common, decent service to our God. This is what God wants. What is your perspective of the Bible? What purpose do you hold on yourself? This is what God has intended for me to do. This is my purpose as a Christian. What is it? And do you take pleasure in it? Man, it's referred to in scripture as having a zeal. You're excited to serve God. You get to serve God. You you get to do things that you wouldn't normally have done and you get blessed for it. What an amazing opportunity we hold as Christians to be active missionaries for Christ. Christ. Telling people of who he is and taking part in other people reaching. Man, we raised enough to support a full missions or a minded trip. That, that's exciting. Hey, we, we have that Bible printing calendar out there and we have the opportunity to see countless souls saved by the gift of the Holy Scripture. In which somebody can turn and see for the wages of sin is death. But, oh, that's the important one. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This morning, if you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the question to you is, why not now? We are not promised tomorrow. I will say this as many opportunities as I can, and it makes sense. Death is not something made up by Christians. One day, a group of pastors didn't get together and say, you know what? Let's scare them into church. Death. No. That sounds like a group of murderers. <laughs> no, but Christ, right? Because of our sin, the wages of sin is death. Right, Because of our disobedience to a loving God who designed us to never die. Because of the disobedient hearts of Adam and Eve and and partaking of the fruit of the garden. Because of that act, death upon all men. Death is not some uh, Christian thing that we do to get people into church. But what I can say is, because you're here, I have the opportunity to say, even though death happens and we don't know when it's going to come, we have the opportunity to receive Christ as our Savior. We have the opportunity to look to a loving God through his word. And I can say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Why? Because God commendeth his love toward me. And that while I was a sinner, he died for me. God commendeth his love towards you. Right? While you you were a sinner, Christ died for you. That's the ultimate picture of love, isn't it? And he died for you so you can look to him, accept him as your Lord and Savior. Say, Lord, I know I've messed up in my life and we all have. Lord, I know I've made mistakes. Lord, I know that I've done wrong, but I ask for your forgiveness. And and through your forgiveness, I best as I know how I accept you as my Lord and Savior, that I may spend eternity with you in heaven. But while I'm here, I may serve you the way that you expect me to. That's where our hearts should be. That's where missions comes into play. That's the importance of missions in our life. 
It's through our love for God. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I'm just grateful for your word. I'm grateful for the opportunity to stand here and to preach the gospel. I'm grateful for the opportunity to look at a portion of the scripture and understand the greatest thing that we can do as a Christian is love you. And by default, we will tell other people. By default, we will want to serve. By default, we will want to fellowship. By default, we will be Christ-like in our endeavors. Lord, but I pray for those in here who maybe have never uh, understood or never heard that without Christ, only hell awaits after death. Maybe they never heard that uh, there was a moment in time when Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died for them. That they can know for sure they're going to heaven when they die. Lord, not knowing if we're, or if we're going to have tomorrow. Not knowing if we'll get hit by a car on the way out of here. I pray that we take to heart and we make sure that we know you as our personal Lord and Savior. Before we leave this place this morning. Lord, I pray for decisions. That we look to our lives and say, how is my fruit doing? Am I even bearing fruit? How, how is my life as a Christian doing? Do I truly love God? If people were to look at me, would they know that I love God? What an important question. Lord, bless this invitation now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.